All right. I'm joined by Julene Zirath, who will be telling us a little bit today um, about herself and about her lab as a preview to the American Diabetes Association a symposium that will be airing uh, next week. Uh, Julene, welcome and thank you for joining me. It's great to be here with you, <laughs> virtually. Yeah, virtually. So um, why don't you begin by just telling us a little bit about uh, you and your lab and the things that you um, are really interested in studying. My background is in exercise physiology, and I'm really, really fascinated by how exercise can be used to, you know, reset metabolism, improve metabolism, and be used potentially to prevent the development of insulin resistance and to be used in the management of type 2 diabetes. And that's what my team is really focused on, those kinds of questions. And how did you get interested in this? Well, I, I got interested in because I was an athlete. I still am an athlete. I guess I'm a lifelong athlete. But I was really interested from the point of view of exercise physiology. And then, you know, my grandfather had um, a cardiovascular disease and had bypass surgery. And I was intrigued by the fact that they used exercise in the rehabilitation for that cardiovascular disease, for his bypass surgery. And that just made me get interested in the notion of exercise being medicine. And I was fascinated with muscle, muscle physiology. And so my research gravitated towards understanding how diet and exercise can be important for the management of um, insulin resistance and the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So before we get into some of the work that you are, will be discussing at the virtual ADA symposium, why don't you tell us about some of the scientific discoveries um, that you've made over the years that most excite you? Um, well, I think partly what I'm really excited about is that our team has been primarily used, using um, humans and focusing on questions from people with diabetes from the starting point. And we've been developing methodologies to study human skeletal muscle in different conditions. So just technically, I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that we could do that. And in terms of what kind of discoveries have we been working on, um, I think some of the things that have really excited me are the identification and kind of validation of enzymes that can metabolize fats and lipids in muscle and mechanisms that can kind of remodel muscle, muscle cells through epigenetic or epigenomic modifications. So that's been I still remember when I was as well. I still remember when I was a postdoc, I read your PGC1 alpha uh, promoter methylation story. And I thought that was fascinating uh, to consider how, again, this interaction between environments um, and uh, some of the machinery driving gene expression and um, uh, sort of cellular fate um, can be influenced. Um, yeah, so I mean, that was kind of diabetes. unexpected as well, because that was work where we were looking at environmental factors, exercise, and then how that could um, kind of modify the genome, affect the promoter methylation of genes that can control mitochondrial function in cells. I had yeah. to take an exercise break because I don't think it's good to sit. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, so, so, so take us back actually in the sort of early on before that paper came out, tell us a little bit like what was known and how did you come up, uh, come across this uh, promoter methylation uh, PGC1 alpha connection? I mean, there was evidence in the field that um, there were changes in promoters and methylation events. And there were workers that were looking at this in the context of beta cell biology, for example. And we were just interested in whether or not there could be changes in muscle cells at a very early stage. Would that be one of the initiation factors that would lead to you know, promoter activation or promoter modulation and changing gene expression? So it's actually Romain Barrez in the lab at the time during his postdoc who did a genome-wide promoter analysis. And um, it was pretty interesting that when we did gene ontology, many of the promoters that had changes in methylation were related to mitochondria. Um, and, and so then it was obvious that you know, we, we studied candidates from that, and it was TFAM, PGC1-alpha, um, and some others, um, PDK, PDK4 as well. Um, so I think that, you know, it was somewhat unexpected because these changes in muscle happened very, very early. And many people thought methylation events were fixed. And, and once something's methylated, that would be fixed. But we could show that this was a dynamic process. That's how it often goes with discovery is, uh, in, in retrospect, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the viewers haven't yet um, seen your 
um, uh, the symposium or, or what you will be talking about. Um, so why don't you just give us a sense about um, sort of some of the topics and some of the big ideas that you'll be discussing uh, in the virtual symposium? Right. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I was tasked with talking in broad scope about metabolism and I honed it down more into how muscle adapts to physical activity and exercise. And um, one part of what I'll talk about is how inactivity and just modifying your sedentary lifestyle by increasing your steps per day, you know, going from just adding more like 800 steps per day can have a modest but clinically relevant improvement in um, H HbA1c um, HDL levels. So, you know, the idea there is that exercise is a medicine and even a little bit of dosing of exercise is really good. And then the other thing that I'll talk about is, um, well, I'm pretty intrigued by circadian biology and that, you know, a lot of our behavior and our physiology is under circadian control, this diurnal clock, this 24-hour clock. Mm -hmm. So I, the other part of the talk will be, how can we time what we eat and what we do with our, our intrinsic clock? And all organs have a circadian clock. And I'm interested in the clocks that are in muscle that can control metabolism and genes that perform metabolism. So we are interested in timing of exercise, you know, whether you, you know, it's always good to exercise and one should always exercise. So the message is, is that you should always find time to exercise, but is there a better time of the day to exercise? And we have some evidence that for people with diabetes, if you do high intensity exercise, perhaps it's better to do that exercise in the afternoon to minimize or to lower blood sugar levels. And then um, the other aspect I'm going to talk about is some work we have with time-restricted feeding. And it's you know, becoming um, clear that if we can restrict the amount of time per day that we're eating, you know, we shorten the window where we're exposing ourselves to calories, that actually has a benefit on our health. So you can almost call it prolonged fasting. And we've done some analyses in the lab to ask the question, if you narrow the window during the day in which you're exposed to food, does it have an improvement in metabolism and muscle? So those are the kinds of things we're interested in. Um, integrating yeah, having, our lifestyle with our circadian clock. Having moderated uh, that, that symposium, that session, I was quite excited by some of the ideas that, that you presented in it. Um, you know, in my opinion, one of the most exciting new ideas in thinking about metabolism and metabolic physiology is this idea of the circadian um, and the timing of some of these interventions. Uh, the first, of course, was time-restricted feeding and thinking about when to eat. Um, but then, of course, that can be extended to um, the timing of exercise and the timing of, um, of taking medicines for mm -hmm. diseases and the time, you know, the timing of everything is going to be uh, important. And so um, how then do you start to disentangle some of the complexity of uh, dose and now time and mode and duration and all of these, uh, these other elements? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, for the, for the talk that I had or that you'll hear, I primarily, we did all that work in humans. But I do think it's um, useful to utilize cell and animal models to be able to dial in some of these in a real controlled way. So, you know, we do have some studies in animal models where we're trying to dose exercise and we're calibrating the diets. But of course, that can be done in humans as well. And I guess for the human studies, one really has to consider the diversity that we have, the genetic diversity, um, and the idea to try to personalize that. We're not all the same. I mean, we have mouse strains and they're basically inbred. So those studies are easier. But, um, you know, what I'm excited about as well is personalized medicine. And I know that that's going to be a big topic throughout the meeting. So how do we actually personalize our diet, our exercise, our sleep patterns, and use all of that information to uh, improve metabolism going forward? One of the constant themes throughout your research program has been using uh, humans uh, or human tissues um, as uh, like the ideal or the first place oftentimes in your studies uh, to, to begin and line of investigation. Uh, when did you make that decision or how did you make that decision to prioritize? It's, it's much more rare, uh, especially in the field of biomedical research where model organisms are, are uh, plentiful. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, well, it's probably my personal career narrative. I mean, I started my career um, really coming from the point of the athlete you know, and, um, and, and, and exercise physiology, you know, the humans have been a great, great model. So a lot of the exercise physiologists have studied people um, and through performance. 
And I, I, I'm always, you know, fascinated with how is the biology, how are the discoveries going to impact the people with disease? And so I guess just for me, I've been interested in knowing what is the problem? What is the biological problem in the clinical situation with the people? And then how can we fix that? And I mean, there's, you know, another, another way to approach science is just to say, I'm really interested in this level of biology. I want to know how all of that works. But I guess I wanted to know what goes wrong and how can we fix it in people who have disease? And so um, I guess if it's not clinically relevant, then I have deprioritized trying to study the question. And that's just been my personal choice in my, my science. So what then do you think are some of the biggest questions or, or biggest not yet solved problems in the field of diabetes? Well, I mean, I'll go back to this with exercise because it actually does work. You know, I mean, it really is clear that if we're able to move, we're made to move, if we can keep our body weight down, we can prevent or delay the onset of, of diabetes. That's for sure. But then the question is, why is it so hard for people to do that? It's such a simple thing, but it's really challenging. It's hard. And so I actually do think trying to find ways to motivate people to continue to live those kinds of lifestyles and understand what drives that behavior would be an exciting you know, area of research to go forward because there's so much power in um, lifestyle in this regard. And then how can we harness that to help people live healthier? Yeah, it seems like it's a pretty big step, though, for a, a, a researcher to take from uh, physiology and mechanisms of disease into behavioral psychology and asking why people do or don't do uh, yeah. what they should. Um, so, hey, except I do think. All right. So I would say doing some of the studies we're doing in, in people and getting clinical evidence for improvements and then messaging that so people can understand how these modifications can improve their health, you know, keeping people aware of the science. I actually do believe that that will make people more motivated to participate. And we see that now with a lot of tracking systems and Fitbits and watches and devices, people are really intrigued with their physiology. So I, I think the more people know, I hope the more engaged they're going to be in taking control over their, their lifestyle to improve their health. One of the things I also um, was excited about in your talk was um, one of the vignettes that you uh, shared was integrating some large scale data sets, some multi omic integration um, and using some tools in data science to try to understand um, the sort of big picture questions. What role do you think um, the, the data science and some of these data integration techniques is, is going to play in the future of you know, diabetes research? Right. So the work that you're talking about was driven by a postdoc in the lab, Nico Pilon. And we are facing an enormous amount of data that's already in the public domain. And what he did was he put together a, a meta-analysis of all the muscle transcriptomic data from human studies where people did ex different exercise paradigms. And I, I actually think that that's really exciting as well, because um, huge amount of investments have been made in these kinds of experiments. And to be able to go back to data and mine that data and test out new ideas is incredibly valuable. I think we're going to see more and more of that. Um, and, you know, we'll be able to utilize these kinds of data years, years, years ahead. It's not like one experiment and then it's published, you don't see it anymore. We're going to be building upon this data and integrating more layers of um, metrics to be able to solve some of these complex mysteries of, of our physiology. Um, so I would just say to any young person starting out in your career, make sure you get some training in bioinformatics because you will absolutely need that. And during this COVID business right now, many labs have been shut down. Um, and my advice to my fellows is go online and start to do some, you know, home learning on informatics. And we've been running some camps um, in our teams to uh, increase awareness about bioinformatics. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, one of the challenges, though, that I'll just bring up um, with so much data available, um, it really uh, uh, one challenge is where to get the data. But then the second challenge is the quality of the data. And so how are you thinking about some sort of metrics to ensure high quality data are going into, you know, some of the models uh, that you develop? Um, right? So you mean in the public domain or in my own lab? Um, I would say mostly in the public domain. I mean, in your lab, hopefully, uh, you would yeah. feel like you have some control over uh, quality metrics. Well, I think, all right, so I think when you utilize these kinds of data in the public domain, I mean, that's not your definitive end result. I mean, you may, some of these, you might use this data as a, a hypothesis generator 
But I would always say you want to do a second line of investigation to, to validate. You know, you, you need to kind of see things a few different ways. So you may get um, a pathway that you have kind of, kind of pulled out of some transcriptomic data. And then you're going to go back into your lab and then create some experimental paradigms where you can test the robustness of that um, and do real mechanistic studies to make some kind of definitive conclusion about the results. So I don't think it's just one thing. You're going to have a lot of tools in your hands to be able to get to, um, you know, get to, to solve the puzzle. And then, you know, hopefully other labs will be able to repeat the experiments. And then at some point you'll get to where things are settled science. Yeah, it's a it's a quite exciting time. Um, so then just a couple of final questions uh, to wrap up. When you are looking for uh, young people, um, trainees, some um, graduate students or postdocs to join your lab, what sorts of things do you look for? Um, well, I think I, I really um, an individual's passion for what they're doing is a big thing for me, because I think that, um, you know, if you're really excited and interested in the science, I think you're going to go very far. So that's certainly one important quality I think people need to have. Um, the other is, uh, you know, training, of course. You know, what knowledge do you bring to the team? What's your background? Um, is it going to be complementary to our team? Will we learn from you? Are there things that you can bring us? And also, is this the right environment where it can complement your skill sets already? So I think a lot of it's a matching in terms of skills. And then, um, you know, generally we have a particular project that we're um, recruiting for. So uh, there, you know, it's going to be every recruitment is very specific to the project that we have. Um, but um, I would just say that those are some of the things that I look for. And obviously, you know, um, people that have an a, a interest in metabolism and endocrinology. And then you also said for young people, um, you recommend uh, some training in bioinformatics um, or, or data science skills in order to be able to handle uh, sort of the future um, of, mm -hmm. of data and data availability. Um, what other advice would you give to um, young trainees as they are preparing or moving through uh, the training phase of their, their scientific careers? Yeah, I mean, you're going to be a lifelong learner. So, I mean, you know, all of us are always learning. That's what we do. I mean, that's what research is. So there's always opportunities to learn more and take those opportunities as much as you can. Um, I would say, think about um, the global scientific enterprise, really think about you have the whole world to be able to look at in terms of career opportunities and connections and collaborations. And so, you know, keep your mind open to that. Um, it, I think it's important throughout your career that every, um, Every step you make in your training, it should be sort of an evolution. I think that even in an early stage in your career, you can kind of chart out where do I want to be in the next, the next step or the next step after that. So have a plan um, rather than be real random about it. Um, and then follow the things that you're incredibly passionate about. You know, I just, you're going to spend an enormous amount of your life and there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. And sometimes there's more downs than ups. So find some project, uh, an area of science that you're really passionate about, and then find a, a way to put your own unique uh, fingerprint on that. And, and I think then you'll make a contribution. Um, and you are certainly find a lot of satisfaction with what you do. I mean, you'll find that satis I don't want to say job satisfaction because I never think of this as a job, but you, it'll be satisfying. All right. Well, we're excited to learn from your uh, symposium that you'll give uh, in just a, a few days time. So thank you, Julian, for your time today. Yeah, great. It was great to touch base with you.